Okay, let me make a comment of it because actually in, in the homework description it tells you be careful in differentiating these continuous functions, right? So uh, the problem that you are referring to, I guess, is the one which goes like e to the minus x over a or something, right? Right, this is the problem. Okay, so <laughs> what does the wave function look like? As a function of x, it looks something like this, right? So if we want the expectation value of p squared, we have to differentiate this twice. So if I differentiate this once, I'm going to get, okay, positive derivative. So it'll go like that. Negative derivative, which means there's a jump here. So this is our deep psi dx, right? Now, what happens when you differentiate this one more time? Okay, so positive derivative, positive derivative, that's nice. But there's a discontinuity here, right? There's a jump. So that generates, going from that point to that point, a minus a delta function. Okay, with some coefficient which is related to how big the jump is. So if you don't include this, obviously you are going to get the wrong answer. Okay, so that's why uh, people who are having difficulty with in finding the expectation value of p squared uh, have problems if they obviously miss this delta function. But you can, what you can also do is remember we went through this, the uh, expectation value of p squared, you can also uh, calculate through uh, deep psi uh, dx magnitude squared dx, uh, which then, of course, you are working with this function, and then you don't have the problem of the delta function. Okay, so that's the root of the problem if you are uh, getting negative p squared and things like that. Okay, other questions? Okay, uh, so let's now go back to our uh, the time dependent Schrodinger equation. It has the form i h bar del psi del t is equal to uh, the p squared, okay, or 2m plus v of x times psi, okay? What is p? p is an <coughs> operator which has the form h over i del del x, so it's a second derivative operation. Let's, let me just put that in and do that again. I h bar del psi del t is equal to minus h bar squared or 2m del squared del x squared plus v of x psi. So this is the kinetic energy term, that's the potential energy term. So kinetic energy plus potential energy, we call it the Hamiltonian, okay, as we did in classical mechanics. I h bar del psi del t is equal to h, okay, the Hamiltonian times psi. So this h contains second derivatives inside it, okay? So we are interested in now solving this problem. We want to see how we can find solutions to it. So, so this is a partial differential equation. And what we do as a first step analysis in most linear partial differential equations of various number of variables is to 
use a nice trick which is known as the separation of variables. So what we'll do is we'll try to find solutions for this psi of x and t. Okay, I'll write it like this, which will mean linear combinations of functions which are functions of time multiplied by functions of position. Okay, so it will have two different bits, t dependent, x dependent. And we'll see that we are going to find a family of such solutions. And since it's a linear equation, any linear combination of these things will be a general solution, okay? So it's not just necessarily going to be just one term like this, but sum of terms like that, okay? That's what I mean by those brackets. So let's just plug that in into our equation, okay? So <coughs> this is going to, to give me I h bar <coughs> del, del t of t times u is equal to h t times u, okay? And <coughs> what happens is since this is the only t dependence in my function, this time derivative will differentiate that and it will be an ordinary derivative. And h contains x derivatives, so it will operate on u, t will be just like a constant, okay? So that will just factor out. So the equation that I am going to get is going to be i h bar, u is not operated on by the time derivative, and I have ordinary derivative of capital T with respect to time. And that will be equal to capital T times H U. So this contains, remember this H, H contains derivatives with, with respect to X. So I have to be careful. Okay, it's just not simple multiplication. H is operating on U. Let me divide the whole equation by t times u. So I'll get i h bar, derivative of t with respect to small t, divided by capital T, the u's cancel. And on the right hand side, the capital T's will cancel. I'll have h times u over u. Okay, then the argument goes like, since this is a function of time, t only, and this is a function of x only, the only way they can be equal, okay, so I don't want any t dependence here, and I don't want any x dependence there. So the only way that can happen is if these things are equal to a constant. So the constant, mm -hmm. let's just see what we have. H is <coughs> as units of energy, it's the total energy. So U, whatever its units are, they cancel. So this thing has units of energy. You can do the same thing over here. <coughs> Both sides have units of energy as that they should. So let me call this thing E. So it's going to be a constant with units of energy. So let me just set that constant to E, okay? So now we look at what these equations mean. The time dependence is the easier part. I h bar d dt small t, okay, is equal to E, some constant E, <coughs> times T, okay, because there's a, another T in the denominator. So what type of solutions do I have for <coughs> such a differential equation? Exponential. Exponential, right? Because derivative of T 
as the same form apart from a constant. So I'm going to get t of t equal to e to the minus i e t over h bar. That's very nice because remember when we started out our discussion about the waves, we saw that the time dependence went like e to the minus i omega t and omega was the energy of the state divided by h bar. So that's very convenient. This e looks like the energy of the state. Okay, from okay, we get we seem to get that from the this hint. Okay, so that's the time dependence t. Obviously, I can always multiply this by a constant, uh, but since this is also going to be multiplied by u, I'll just use a single constant to take care of both the t dependence and the x dependence. Okay? What about the x dependence? x dependence says h times, well, h operating on u is equal to e u. So this says this linear operator, which contains derivatives with respect to x and v of x, okay, so operating on u is equal to some constant times that function u again. Okay, so this is the equation that contains the details about what the system is. Okay, sorry, after telling you to turn off your phones, my phone starts ringing. Uh, it says who, if you want to know, uh, if you want to know what to, it's saying in Morse code, it's asking who, because the guy is not listed in my phone book. Okay, so <coughs> I have something like this, uh, and <coughs> I then, let me just write this out in full, h is going to be minus h bar squared over 2m, ordinary derivative now, because there's no longer any time dependence, okay, plus v of x, u of x is equal to e u of x, okay, so this is the equation in its full form. Now, uh, equations of this type an operator acting on something gives me a constant times that something is called an eigenvalue equation, okay? So you may have seen such structures in the linear algebra course where H would be a matrix, okay? And U would be a vector and you would get matrix times vector equals an eigenvalue times the eigenvector. Okay, so that's something in linear algebra. We'll see that there's a nice relationship, one to one actually, between the linear algebra of matrices and vectors and equations like this. In fact, when <coughs> quantum mechanics started, there were two approaches. One was a matrix approach, which we are not going to discuss, except perhaps in uh, harmonic oscillator a little bit, uh, which was developed by Heisenberg, and the Schrodinger equation, which was developed by Schrodinger. So people first learned about the difficult method, the Heisenberg method, and then when Schrodinger wrote down his equations, then they saw that there is this association between them and the uh, talk was that, okay, we trust Heisenberg, but we'll use Schrodinger. That's because the Schrodinger equation is a much direct, straightforward, you solve a differential equation, everything is transformed. The, it's a little more difficult to construct an equivalent matrix for that. But still, uh, just keep in mind that this is, we are going to use methods of linear algebra. So uh, we have this equation now, which we need to solve. 
And depending on what V of x is, this can be very simple or very difficult or analytically impossible. Okay, so the differential equations have a way of going haywire when you put uh, complicated functions into them. Okay, with very simple modifications of V of x, you can get very difficult equations. So depending on what the system is, we are going to get <coughs> different types of solutions to this u of x. And one thing that is okay, apparent is that the solution will depend on what e is. Okay, because we have not said anything yet about what e is. We said it's going to be a constant and it enters into this equation and whatever value of e that I put in, I'm going to get a different function. So let me just put a subscript e on this because this solution depends on what E is, okay? Depending on what value of E you choose, you are going to get a different solution. Now, what happens is that you get two types of solutions to this equation. Okay, so let's look at that. <coughs> In You can get localized solutions. When do these things come about? When you have a potential well, okay, so if you have some V of X, which is a function of X, okay, you can Okay, so that's the energy scale. And I can choose a certain E. Okay, so suppose I choose some E over here. What will happen? There will be two forms, okay, two qualitative behavior for the function U. Okay, so if I just look at what is going on, these two points are important because you see over here, E is greater than V, whereas over here, V is greater than E. And if I, now I'm interested in finding out what U of X is. So U of X, well, U sub E of X, U which corresponds to this E. Okay, first of all, let's identify the significance of these points. You see, these points are the points where the potential energy is equal to the total energy. So at those points, classically, kinetic energy is zero. So classically, if you have a particle, that particle, okay, exists only between those two points. Because otherwise you would get a negative kinetic energy, which is in classical mechanics doesn't make sense, right? So over here, I have some kinetic energy plus potential energy, and the object will be moving. At those points, the kinetic energy becomes zero, which means the velocity becomes zero and the particle returns back. So the particle just oscillates between those points. So those points are called the classical turning points. Okay, so the, those are the points between which the particle exists if it's a classical particle. Now, quantum mechanically, if I have E greater than V, what type of equation does that represent? Let's just, let me just uh, <coughs> rewrite this equation. Let me put this as D squared dx squared. <coughs> u 
is equal to, I'll move everything to the other side. So it's going to be E minus V times U E of X. And that will be a coefficient, which will be minus 2M over H bar squared. Okay, so I have just rearranged the terms in this equation, okay? So just trying to understand what type of solution I am going to get to this equation approximately, okay? If E is greater than V, I have second derivative of U is equal to a negative quantity. This V is a function of X, but I'm sort of ignoring that it's changing with X. All I'm looking at is its sign. So E minus V is positive. So I have this U equal to minus a number times U. What type of solutions do I get from differential equations of that form? Hmm? Well, okay, complex exponential, sinusoidal, okay, oscillating solutions. So in regions where you have E minus V, you have these oscillating solutions. So I'm going to get oscillating solutions. If E minus V is larger, it will oscillate faster. Otherwise, it will oscillate slower. So I'm going to get some oscillating solutions in the middle. What type of solutions will I get if V is larger than E? Okay, so if V is larger than E, then this bracket is negative. So second derivative of U becomes something positive times U. What type of solutions do I get then? Because for negative exponentials, but all negative exponentials are uh, discriminating. Okay, well, we will get positive, yes, and negative exponentials. So I am going to get <coughs> exponentials which decay in X or diverge in X. So there will be two types of solutions on both sides. Okay. So what I can do is I can start out over here with the physical solution, something I want something that doesn't diverge as it as I go to minus infinity in X. So I start with this physical solution. It will start oscillating and then I'll reach this right hand side and then this will continue as a linear combination of these two solutions. Okay, so I really do not have much of a freedom in choosing which one contributes how much. Okay, I can start with a certain initial condition, well, boundary condition over here, but by the time this just integrates into the right hand side, this could be also exploding, which then will be unphysical. So the only way out is if I just adjust this E, a little bit this side, but maybe a little above, etc., until I find just the right E, which doesn't have any, okay, diverging component. So I am going to get certain special value of E, okay, so valid values of E, okay, are those which, okay, <coughs> give decaying okay functions at x equal to plus or minus infinity okay so and not everything will actually give me a decaying solution okay so those other E values are not going to be physical. 
the physical values, the physical solutions, the valid solutions, will be one, ones that actually give decaying functions over there. So they, they will be discrete values. So this will co correspond to certain discrete values of E. So there will be only certain values which correspond to proper solutions. So I'll perhaps have an E1, an E2, and E3. So there will be certain definite energy levels. And this we call energy is quantized. Okay, so energy gets quantized in a local localized solution. That's in fact where the name quantum mechanics comes from. Okay? So these are localized solutions. You can have the another type of solution. Those are either extended but more likely scattering. Okay, solutions. These are solutions in which you may have, again, some structure in the potential, but at infinity, so in this case, our potential looks something like this. This is my V of X as a function of X. Let me see if I can get more contrast out of some other color pen here. Okay, so, and in this case, I have this V of X. Uh, let's see. And <clears throat> there's some energy level, let's call it zero. It's customary to call the potential at infinity zero. So that's our potential energy at x equal to plus or minus infinity. And then there is some structure in some part of the potential. It may be either negative or positive. And then what I do is I shoot electrons with a certain positive energy. So I have a certain positive energy electron which is being shot by this. So this is something that cannot be quantized because here I have my experimentalist, okay, shooting particles. So that person adjusts the energy of the electron, the kinetic energy. There is no potential energy, V is zero. So now I'm going to get, okay, E equal to zero, well, E equal to finite, but V equal to zero solutions. What are those solutions? Let's just take a look. Okay, so if I have V equal to zero, I have D squared, dx squared minus h bar squared over 2m. This actually, we looked at it in the very first set of lectures when we started the course. <coughs> and this is equal to E times UE. So what are the solutions? Sinusoids. Hmm? Yes, so it's again oscillating sinusoidal solutions. So they look like E to the uh, I, K, X type of solutions, where this K, if you just go through the algebra, okay, so this is what the UE is, uh, and you can just check that H bar squared, K squared, which was our momentum squared, over 2M is equal to the energy. So the kinetic energy, which is all that I have here, the kinetic energy is equal to E, and that is the wave then, okay, so it's the wave is coming in, then of course the wave will have a different structure here, because there's this potential, but over here the solutions are again going to be waves, okay, either transmitted or reflected. 
So this is another type of solution which extends all the way to plus or minus infinity. So we'll look at these types of solutions separately, okay? So these are the scattering solutions and we'll analyze them separately from the bound state solutions, okay? So these are these things that we have over here. These are localized solutions and the states that we get are Okay, the bound states because they cannot move around. Okay, so that's the terminology. Any questions up to this point? So this is the general strategy with which we are going to work with. So we'll now introduce various forms of V of X. We'll first start with uh, bound state problems localized solutions, and then we are going to uh, see, okay, let me pass it around this way this time. So, yes? How should I read that when an electron is not bound, it's, not, its energy is not quantized? Okay, <clears throat> the question is, can I have a quantized electron, okay, when it's, not localized, and energy, how do we know that the energy is not quantized? Okay, because we know that the solutions that we get for positive energy are going to be of this form. Okay, so there are no bound state problems with E greater than zero. Okay. So, uh, where are we? Which way do we continue? Let's. Yes, sure. Um, how do we normalize sinusoids? How do we normalize? Okay, these types of sinusoids, which extend all the way from plus or minus infinity, there are two ways of interpreting it. One, which we saw earlier, we say this A e to the i k x type of form is associated with a current Okay, probability current, which turns out to be constant, so it's going to be A star A times H bar K over M. So the A in front of it is a measure of the probability current. It's no longer, we do not need to find the probability of where the particle is. For problems like this, we are sending a particle in, and we are interested in the probability that it gets reflected or transmitted. So for those cases, a probability current description of the wave is more useful. But we'll also see that these types of waves, we will be expanding other wave functions in terms of these, in which case, Okay, we are really using the Fourier analysis, and for that case, some sort of normalization is convenient, and we'll see that when we get there. Okay, other questions? All right, so let's start with the simplest case. The simplest case is Okay, so I'm looking at bound states. The simplest case would be uh, the case where V is equal to zero, obviously, but that's like the free particle. But I want to uh, localize the particle. So what I'll do is I'll trap the particle, okay, trap the electron in a potential like this which is changing between x equal to zero and a, and the potential is zero in this region, okay, so v is equal to zero in this region, but it's infinitely high, so that will be my notation to show infinite potential over there. Okay, so this is a uh, box <coughs> with infinite 
walls, if you like. Okay, so the particle is trapped in the region between x equal to 0 and x equal to a. Obviously, I could trap it any place on the x-axis, and that will just shift the solutions. And some other choice may be more convenient. So its choice of the x-axis is a matter of convenience. We'll see that if, for example, you center this well at, at x equal to 0, we can then use the symmetry arguments to make our life easier. But initially, I'll start like this. OK, so I have now my uh, Schrodinger equation. So this is now the time-independent Schrodinger equation, unlike the original form, which was time-dependent. We are now using the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which says minus h bar squared over 2m, OK, del squared well, d squared, dx squared, ordinary derivative, u <coughs> sub e is equal to, no potential in the center, is equal to e times ue. So that's the equation I need to solve, very simple equation. But I also have boundary conditions. OK, so what are the boundary conditions? Okay, I don't want. Hmm? Um, continuity at zero and a. Okay, we want continuity at zero and a. Why? Why do we want continuity? Because as soon as you put derivatives, okay, uh, the discontinuities into derivatives and such things, you start to generate large amounts of momentum, right? We, uh, if you look at the expectation value of momentum, it contains. Uh, derivatives of objects. So uh, if you have a discontinuity in the function that corresponds to an infinite jump in the derivative, which is not uh, going to be good for various physical quantities. So <laughs> what I want is this ue of x is equal to 0 at x equal to 0 and at x equal to a. So the solutions to this equation, let me write it one more time, d squared dx squared ue is equal to 2me <coughs> over h bar squared ue. There's a minus, thank you, which is very important. So the <coughs> solutions are sinusoidals. So the ue of x is possibly something like sine kx or cosine kx. What is k? Well, you can easily see that this second derivative is going to take out a minus k squared. So you are going to get minus k squared is equal to minus 2me over h bar squared, or e is equal to h bar squared uh, <coughs> k squared over 2m. OK, so again, you see, since this is the kinetic energy, you have p squared over 2m here, and h bar k is asso again associated with the momentum of the particle. Although we have to be a little careful because this is not a free particle. Okay, this discussion was based on the free particle. Here we have a particle which is confined to some part of space, <coughs> but still h bar k squared acts like the uh, momentum squared divided by 2m is the energy. All right, this was time. OK, so <coughs> those are the solutions that I can use. Now, one thing, the fact that this function has to go to 0 
at x equal to 0 means I cannot use the cosine. So I have the sine, but now I have various possibilities. So again, you see these boundary conditions limit the values of k in this case, which is related to E, that you can use for physical solutions. So if I now look at this function u of x between 0 and a, you see I, can, I have various possibilities. I can have a sine wave which goes like this. I can have a sine wave which goes like that. So it has, it's nice. It always starts from 0, but it also has to end with a 0 at x equal to a and so on. Okay, So the solutions u e of x is equal to some normalization constant, which I'll now introduce, which will take care of the normalization of the whole <coughs> e times t type of function. And <coughs> then it's going to be sine okay n pi over a times x so that's my those are my k's so i am going to get a k so k n let me squeeze it over here is this n pi over a <coughs> and the energy which corresponds to it, so En is going to be h bar squared over 2m times k squared, so it's going to be pi squared over a squared times n squared. Okay. So you see now my energy is quantized. I can have n equal to 1, 2, 3, etc. I cannot have n equal to 0. If I put n equal to 0, my whole wave function becomes 0. Okay? So <coughs> n can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. corresponding to these energies. So the particle can have, relative to this potential energy, it can have certain energy E1. Then E2 is four times larger than this. So E2 will be somewhere over here. And E3 is going to be nine times E1, and so on. OK, so these are the energy levels for what we call particle in a box. OK, so when we say particle in a box, we mean a uh, potential like this. It's a one-dimensional box. Okay, so you can construct two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and who is to stop you? Four-dimensional, five-dimensional, if you like. But okay, so we can have all those uh, problems associated uh, with a particle which is confined to some part of space. Okay. By the way, uh, especially the semiconductor technology allows people to construct these things with quite good uh, amount of accuracy. You can have materials which have, in which the electron can move easily uh, for some region of space. And then you have other materials here where the potential energy of the electron becomes not infinitely high, but relatively high, so that the electron is trapped into these potentials. So these things are under the name of quantum dots, okay? If it's a <coughs> small object uh, <coughs> which doesn't extend in any direction, they are called quantum dots. Uh, if you have just one uh, dimension of confinement like this, then that means your electron is confined between two planes, right? And then it's uh, <coughs> a quantum plane. Uh, etc. So you can uh, generate these things experimentally and actually uh, look at it. Okay, any questions? <coughs> yes. 
No, n cannot be a negative integer. Why? Uh, <coughs> because when you put in a negative number here, all it does is that minus comes out and is grouped into this a. So it's not a new solution. So n equal to 2 and n equal to minus 2 are the same functions, just not normalization changes. OK, perhaps this is a good place to give a break, uh, 10 minutes, and then we'll go on. <laughs>